Hello. <clears throat> Welcome to today's briefing. Where do we go from here? Destruction of the CIA interrogation tapes and oversight of the war on terror. I'm Praveen Fernandez, the Associate Director of Programs at the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, otherwise known as ACS. For those of you unfamiliar with ACS, we are a national network of lawyers, law students, and policymakers dedicated to ensuring that fundamental principles of dignity, individual rights and liberties, equality, and access to justice occupy their rightful central role in American law and policy. <clears throat> As you know, ACS is not an advocacy organization. We take no positions on legislati legislation or nominations, and the views of the panelists are, are, are their own, not the view of ACS. What we do have a position on, of course, is on the importance of discussion of critical topics. We're all in favor of that, um, which brings us to today's panel. While our moderator will introduce our distinguished panelists, I have the good fortune of introducing our moderator, Professor Marty Lederman. A true recitation of his accomplishments would take more time than I have, so I'm going to give you the highlight reel. Professor Lederman teaches at Georgetown University Law Center. Prior to that, from 1994 to 2002, he served um, as an attorney advisor in the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel, where he advised on a variety of different affairs. After that, he focused more closely on constitutional and appellate litigation. You may know him from his contributions to the prominent legal blogs, SCOTUS Blog and Balkanization, where he's commented extensively on matters relating to executive power, detention, interrogation, and torture. With David Barron, he has recently published a two-part article in the Harvard Law Review on the question of Congress's authority to regulate the Commander-in-Chief's conduct of war. Without further ado, Professor Lederman. Uh, thanks so much, and thanks to the American Constitution Society for putting together this very timely and important panel on a subject that's in the papers virtually every day. Um, the question, where do we go from here, could have many different answers, and so I think you'll find as we go along in our discussion uh, that we will hit on at least uh, three or four distinct topics about how to approach uh, the issues uh, not arising out of the destruction of the CIA tapes, but, uh, but associated with the destruction of the CIA tapes. So let me just briefly tick off what those might be and those, the topics that I think our panelists will concentrate on and give a little bit of the background uh, for the, um, those of you who aren't familiar with how this came, came to pass. Uh, in 2002, the CIA, which had been lacking in human intelligence about al-Qaeda, uh, was fortunate enough to capture some uh, persons that they thought to be high-level CIA uh, al-Qaeda operatives uh, and started to interrogate them in order to obtain intelligence about the inner workings of al-Qaeda. Uh, and these persons included Abu Zubaydah, who was thought to be the number three person or high up in the al-Qaeda uh, um, organization, and Ab al-Rahim al-Nashiri. Uh, and these, we are told that the, these uh, detainees were not giving up very much uh, actionable intelligence and important information. And so discussions were begun within the administration about whether um, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques could be used by the CIA at secret sites overseas, not subject to any particular legal regime in the eyes of the administration. If these techniques could be used, uh, more, more coercive techniques, um, up to and including waterboarding, but also hypothermia, um, severe stress positions, severe sensory and sleep deprivation, and threats. Whether these could be used on these detainees in order to obtain information. And at some point in 2002, the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel and others in the administration gave the CIA the authority uh, to use these techniques. Now, the CIA at the time decided, and it's still a little unclear uh, how this came to pass, that it would start filming these interrogations uh, of these high-level detainees, something that from an intelligence perspective makes a whole lot of sense. This is very important information, or the CIA hoped that it would be. And you would want a formal record so that people outside the black sites could review it and figure out what its possible meaning and importance is or was, uh, and that it would be on hand, such records would be on hand as the so-called mosaic of intelligence information uh, was built up over a number of months 
or years. And so they filmed these enhanced techniques taking place uh, and whatever information was gleaned from these interrogations. Uh, thereafter, several months later, um, many folks within the CIA and elsewhere thought that it was a bad idea to have these tapes. And two things happened. One is that apparently some orders went out to stop taping such interrogations, right, to not create any permanent record of the enhanced interrogation techniques or of the interrogations and the intelligence itself. And secondly, some thought began to be given to destroying the CIA tapes that had been made themselves. Um, and apparently, from what we can tell from, from uh, many uh, terrific stories uh, in, in the press in the last several weeks, um, there were high-level discussions all throughout the executive branch about the possibility of destroying these tapes, going so far as the White House Counsel's Office, the Vice President's Office, throughout the Department of Justice, and throughout the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, and what we know is that there were many, um, some career operational people within the CIA who thought after the Abu, particularly after the Abu Ghraib photographs were uh, publicly disclosed, that one day it would be possible that these tapes would also be exposed and that they display conduct that is potentially illegal but at the very least highly controversial and would put um, the, the CIA agents therefore either in danger of criminal culpability, criminal exposure, or at the very least um, very controversial um, exposure on the Hill and in pu the public realm. Uh, and so these folks did not want these records to remain it, it, they were overseas, apparently, and wanted to get rid of them in some respect. And the discussions went on. And from what we can tell, many lawyers throughout the administration, the Department of Justice and the White House and the CIA, advised the operational folks not to destroy the tapes, um, recommended that the tapes not be destroyed. And at the time, there were several proceedings ongoing, including the 9-11 Commission proceedings, in which they were seeking as much information about detainee interrogations as, as they could get, um, and some court proceedings in which judges had ordered the administration to preserve certain categories of um, information and evidence about interrogations of suspected al-Qaeda personnel. Um, it's not clear whether any of the lawyers in these discussions actually told the folks at the CIA either that it would be illegal to destroy the tapes or that they may not do it. They were never, apparently never given an order, thou shalt not destroy. It was only advised or recommended that they not destroy. And those recommendations may have been equivocal and may even have been, um, may, may even have been met with other um, lawyers telling them that they could destroy it. Anyway, after the 9-11 Commission closed up shop, and Dan Marcus will speak to this a bit, um, Jose Rodriguez, the director of clandestine operations within the Central Intelligence Agency, um, got, apparently got an opinion from some mid-level CIA lawyers, not from the general counsel, not from the Justice Department, that it was no longer unlawful under the various um, uh, destruction of evidence and obstruction of justice statutes, criminal statutes, that it was no longer unlawful for the CIA to destroy this, uh, these tapes. And Rodriguez apparently thereafter, when not getting any directives from anyone else not to destroy them, including, his lawyer says, from Porter Goss, who was the head of the CIA at the time, who met with Rodriguez several times and conspicuously failed to tell Rodriguez not to destroy the tapes, Rodriguez went ahead and gave the order to have the tapes destroyed without checking higher up at, or at the Department of Justice as to the legality of this happening. So in our discussion today, we're going to talk about several things, some related to the destruction of the tapes themselves. There is, as most of you know, a Department of Justice investigation ongoing in which the Attorney General, Michael Mukasey, has appointed John, Dur um, John Durham, a um, career prosecutor from Connecticut, to lead the investigation of possible criminal wrongdoing in association in connection with the destruction of the tapes. And that, that investigation is ongoing, and we probably won't hear anything about it for quite some time. At the same time, the intelligence committees within the Congress are investigating the destruction of the tapes, and the House Intel Committee has already held one closed hearing in which it heard from the acting general counsel, chief counsel of the CIA, John Rizzo. Um, but those hearings, for some reason that the committees have not, um, have not disclosed so far, 
Those hearings have not been public. They are secret hearings, as far as we know, and will continue to be secret, uh, even though the principal topic, the destruction of the tapes, is not about the interrogation techniques themselves. So we will talk about several topics here. One is, I, I suppose we'll talk a little bit about whether the destruction of the tapes might have been um, unlawful or not, although that turns out to be a very, very difficult and hazy question depending on a lot of facts and on some criminal statutes that are notoriously ambiguous and broad themselves. Um, so I don't think that will be the primary focus of our discussion. We will also talk about during this DOJ investigation what the Intel, Intel Committee should be doing with respect to the investigation of the destruction of the tapes um, and or whether they should be more focused on at least two other topics. One is the question of whether all interrogations ought to be, um, ought to be videotaped, um, something that Representative Holt has actually <coughs> dropped a bill, H.R. 4660, that would require the, um, the creation and the retention of tapes of interrogations uh, within the intelligence agencies of high-level al-Qaeda suspects, something that is very helpful from an intelligence um, collection perspective. Um, and also whether the intelligence committees should be doing more than they have so far on investigating and regulating the conduct that transpires during these interrogations. That is to say, the enhanced interrogation techniques themselves. Um, so we will talk about those topics, about whether those techniques are lawful and if, whether they are or not, whether Congress should do anything more to regulate the CIA's conduct of these um, investigations, but also about how oversight in the intelligence committees can be strengthened and made more effective than it has been um, recently. And we might take a little bit of a detour to discuss a, something of a side issue, but one that's received a lot of attention lately, which is whether General Mukasey ought to have appointed a so-called special counsel rather than Mr. Durham. Um, that, that is to say, whether he should have given Mr. Durham independence in his DOJ investigation. Durham is subject to review and control of Maine Justice, of Mukasey and the Deputy Attorney General, if and when he is confirmed. Um, and it's so, therefore, he is not making the final decisions as to any possible indictments or, or um, trials. Those decisions will be subject to Mukasey's control. And there have been some, um, there's some on the Hill and elsewhere who have urged Attorney General Mukasey to give Durham or some other prosecutor so-called independence uh, to make those decisions without the um, input or control of political appointees within the Department of Justice. Having said that, I will give brief introductions as I tee up questions to each of these wonderful panelists. Um, you have much fuller introductions um, in the, in the, in the uh, handout that was given to you as you came in. Um, and most of these folks need little introduction. I'm, I'm going to ask the first question of um, my pa the panelists to my left. I'm very honored to be here with um, Frederick Fritz Schwartz, um, who was the chief counsel of the church committee um, that in the mid-1970s um, engaged in the most wide-ranging and most effective and most famous investigation of the intelligence community that our nation has ever seen. Those hearings were largely but not completely done in public. Um, and were quite effective at, at, um, at leading to reforms of the intelligence community, both legal and, and otherwise. Um, Fritz is now the senior counsel at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University Law School, um, where with Aziz, Aziz Huck, he has recently published a book on a topic um, close to my heart, Unchecked and Unbalanced, Presidential Power in a Time of Terror, uh, which is, like my articles with David Barron, about the topic, largely about the question of whether Congress, whether and to what extent Congress can control the President's conduct of an armed conflict or a war. Um, and so, Fritz, I'll ask you at the, at the start, what did you learn in the, in the Church Committee hearings and in what was effective and not effective about both those hearings and the Pike Committee hearings at the same time, which were much more contentious, um, that gives you some insight into how the intelligence committees today might change the manner in which they're overseeing the CIA and other intel? Well, I, I think maybe I'll start with an a internal discussion or disagreement we had on the church committee about how to proceed, where there were some people who said the right thing to do is to bring in some wise, they said then men, 
who would say what the problems were and what the remedies ought to be. And then others, I as uh, leading the argument, said, no, you can never get reform unless you have a fact-based in investigation, because if you don't have a fact-based investigation in which whatever is wrong is publicly disclosed, the public is never going to support having any kind of changes that make any difference. So that was, I think, an important threshold question. Then um, how do you conduct an investigation uh, that's going to be effective and fact-based? You have to get the documents. I'm, I know the 9-11 people would agree with that. If you don't have the documents the, which demonstrate better than people coming in and telling a story, are more likely to be closer to the truth. doesn't mean documents are always truthful or tes testimony is always not truthful. But without documents, you can't do effective cross-examination, and you're much less likely to know what the truth is. So again, a threshold battle for any congressional committee is insisting on getting the documents. We got them. We got more access than ever has happened in the history of the world. Um, perhaps aided by the fact that President Ford had just taken over for Richard Nixon, and President Ford, while advisors like Henry Kissinger and Dick Cheney wanted him to defy us, President Ford was of the view that having taken over from a disgraced president who was in trouble for having misused the power of the intelligence agencies, he was not going to stonewall. So we got the documents. Then you need to have important preparation for your hearings. And there, the preparation part, it's perfectly OK. In fact, it's probably better to do the depositions uh, in executive session. And we certainly never put on any witnesses I think with the exception of Henry Kissinger, uh, who somehow got away without being deposed, uh, I think we never put, I'm, I'm sure, other than that, we never put on a witness in public testimony who had not previously um, been deposed, where you get the story, you see how they react to things. So I think that's another vital part. It, another point is it's important to be nonpartisan. Maybe I'll come back to that a little bit. Um, but so then, then you've got the facts, you've got the documents, you've taken the deposition. Do you make every hearing in the first instance, every committee hearing in the first instance public? We didn't with absolutely every one. Uh, we decided on the assassinations investigation, uh, which went deep into the CIA's uh, covert action, um, that we would hold the hearings in the first instance in executive session. But then we published a 300-page uh, report which laid out in enormous detail what had happened. With respect to the FBI, all our hearings were in public. With respect to NSA, they were all in public. We were very careful not to reveal the technologies that NSA was using. And you can distinguish, that's a good example, you can distinguish between what ought to be kept secret and what need not be kept secret. And the way NSA captured certain things from the air at that time was really unusual and very secret. So there was no reason we needed to expose that in order to expose the fact that they had gotten every single um, electronic communication that left the United States for 30 years. Every single one was in the hands of the government. Uh, now, you mentioned the Pike Committee. The Pike Committee was the committee in the House. Um, they did not succeed, uh, whereas the Senate Committee did succeed, I think for um, three reasons. Uh, one was that they didn't keep their mouth shut. Uh, and when they ought not to have, they leaked confidential information which they should not have leaked. Uh, we were very careful. There was never a single leak that came out of the Church Committee, except one from a senator that indicated the gender of the person who was both connected with John Kennedy and connected with the mafia head who had been hired to, heal, to kill Castro. And the other one was a staff person who uh, told, as a matter of gossip, something that was embarrassing to a particular senator not on the committee. 
With those two exceptions, neither of which had anything to do with national security, not a single leak came out of the Church Committee, and lots came out of the Pike Committee. And then another mm -hmm. one, I think, is one where they made the mistake in getting the documents from the government of saying, we have to have every single line in a relevant document, and we will not allow any temporary redactions of certain things. And I'll illustrate what we were willing to do and they weren't, um, and it hurt them very badly. Uh, the NAC, the FBI infiltrated Martin Luther King's organization, infiltrated the NACP, actually infiltrated the NACP for 30 years, had informers sitting in an organization they knew to be entirely lawful. And we said, we're going to look at that. They said, well, in the first instance, when we produce the documents that relate to that, let us take out the name of the particular informer who was within the NACP. I agreed to that because we had the right thereafter, if it was relevant to our investigation, to press for the name. Uh, but we, what we wanted to prove, really, was the fact of the excessive and long and illegal and improper uh, infiltration of the NACP. The Pike Committee simply would not, would not do that. Uh, and as a result, the intelligence agencies didn't give the sort of thing to the Pike Committee that they gave to us. And then the third and final reason, and then I'm going to stop, was the Church Committee, while ultimately there were differences on, on, on remedy, and once or twice, <coughs> there was a, a difference on disclosure. The, the Church Committee never broke, never once broke on partisan lines. And in the House, there was a more partisan atmosphere, and I think that made their investigation also less effective. Let me, um, in light of that, I, I'm curious because you, you say you got these documents, you didn't leak them, but then you published a 300-page report ex describing in incredible detail what the CIA well, and the... 300 on that one and 800 right. 900 I mean, it, it, other pages of Right. Us, it, it's, it's quite a remarkable set of documents describing in detail um, without, without revealing sources and without revealing identities of agents um, or technologies that were still secret, but, 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 a, but a pretty specific and thorough historical account of what had been done, what the legal theories were for why it was permissible or why it was not permissible. Um, and that sort of accounting is what's been completely missing here. And I don't know whether that was because that information was not deemed classified by the CIA no, they, or... They, and the FBI. They, they, they thought everything we revealed was... Was classified. Was, it was classified. Right. <laughs> Although J. Edgar Hoover had files that he never bothered to stamp classified because it was regarded as totally impossible that anybody would ever look at the FBI. So case. the problem today, I think, is that many, the, the, the general process now in much of these um, controversies is for the administration to give some sort of notice to the, either the Gang of Four or the Gang of Eight, a small group of legislators who are not allowed to consult with their colleagues, their <coughs> counsel, or their staff about these matters. Everything is deemed classified. They don't see the underlying legal documents. And they're told that they can't talk about it with anyone. Yeah, that's, that's and, and then what are they supposed to do at that point, the Gang of Four or the Gang of Eight? Jane Harmon, for instance, suspected that these enhanced interrogation techniques were legally dubious, but the administration was telling her they were perfectly A-OK. -okay. And then what? I mean, she couldn't, why, she hasn't published her 300-page report. It, it makes a mockery of oversight. You cannot have oversight that is secret oversight by a few people. It's just, it just, and then it becomes an excuse and a justification by the administration, oh, well, we told people. Of course, as a general point, and I'm sure Dan, you'll also say this. When, when you get a chance to look at all the secret documents of the government, you, you, you are convinced that much of what is stamped as secret, most of what is stamped as secret, needn't be secret. And much of which is stamped as secret is stamped in order to avoid embarrassment or revealing improp improprieties. So, so what, if, if that's the case, though, if everything is stamped classified and, they, and everyone in Congress, and I'll turn to Dan, and on the 9-11 Commission is told, we're giving you all this information, but it's all classified. 
But then you then produce the 9-11 Commission report, a wonderful document, like the Church Committee reports, <coughs> revealing much of the information, if not the details, that truly would threaten to, to, to harm national security. Why isn't anyone in Congress doing the same? And maybe, maybe it needs to be done on a bipartisan basis so it's not perceived to be simple partisan gamesmanship. But, but Dan, let me ask you about similar questions that came up in the 9-11 Commission with respect to this sensitive information. <clears throat> well, I certainly agree with what Frick. I'm sorry. I didn't oh. Dan was the general counsel to the 9-11 Commission and was one of my, my boss and clients at the Department of Justice as associate attorney general. He's now teaching at, American, at the Washington College of Law at the American University. Uh, thanks, Marty. I certainly agree with what Fritz said about, and this is a commonplace accepted wisdom now, I think, that there's tremendous overclassification uh, in the government, a kind of knee-jerk classification of everything by the intelligence agencies. But I think the publication of both the Church Committee report and the 9-11 Commission report, what it shows is a, I mean, I would imagine that probably 25 percent or more of the factual information in our report was classified information that the administration, in effect, declassified. There never was a formal declassification. Uh, no one signed something saying it's declassified, but our report, before we could publish it, and the staff statements that we uh, published and recited at our public hearings, had to be cleared by the administration, by the CIA, the FBI, and the NSC. Uh, and in, in the process of clearing them, they were in, a, in effect, the material was declassified. And we were, uh, and I think uh, to its credit, uh, uh, the, the administration uh, at the end of the day uh, was quite forthcoming in, in effect, declassifying information so we could publish it in our report. I do think that while there's a lot of overclassification, there is a distinction between historical, basically historical reports like the Church Committee report and our report and current intelligence information. And one of the reasons uh, that, uh, if I can turn now briefly to uh, the 9-11 Commission experience with the CIA with respect to uh, the now famous videotapes. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, as you, if you read the uh, op-ed piece that uh, Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton uh, publish, you can see that even the reasonable, mild-mannered chairman and vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission were pretty upset with the CIA. And I think that we were upset uh, not so much because we think uh, that there's some hidden gem in those videotapes that would have changed what we said in the 9-11 Commission report. I doubt very much that that's the case. Uh, we were upset because uh, we had a course of dealing with the CIA uh, in which we got a lot of information from them, not without difficulty, but we got the information that we thought we needed. We thought we understood what the universe of available information was, and yet we were never told of the existence of the videotapes. Uh, and the reason this was important to us was we got, we got, a, we got all these intelligence reports. The, these are documents that are called TDs. I, I meant to call somebody uh, before this uh, conference today to find out what TD stands for. Maybe David knows. I don't uh, uh, It's clearly classified. Uh, yeah, it's it might be a code word there, it, yeah. I can't figure out what the T is or the D, but these are basically the uh, intelligence reports that are written by CIA, CIA analysts, in this case based on the cables from the interrogators who conducted these interrogations, basically setting forth what uh, took place in uh, these interrogations, uh, and they're circulated within the intelligence community. And we got all those uh, with respect to the 9-11, with respect to uh, interrogation of these high-level detainees on the 9-11 plot and on the history and structure of al-Qaeda generally. We weren't interested in current intelligence information, uh, which obviously was of great importance in these interrogations. The CIA was trying to find out not only about what happened on 9-11 and how, uh, how al-Qaeda managed to do it, uh, but also uh, what the uh, then current plans of al-Qaeda for future uh, plots or attacks on the United States uh, might be. 
And we were very clear to the CIA that we weren't interested in that, and that the intelligence reports we got had material such as that redacted uh, from them. So we got all these intelligence reports, uh, and it was uh, uh, very useful, but uh, we had a lot of questions uh, because we had the job of trying to evaluate for purposes of our report uh, the credibility of what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Abu Zubaydah and all these other guys were saying about what happened on 9-11 and, and uh, uh, the, about the history of al-Qaeda. Um, and uh, so we submitted a bunch of questions to the CIA and got a bunch of answers about how the interrogations were conducted, uh, what, uh, 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 what, how the CIA went about uh, 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 evaluating credibility when there were different accounts from different uh, detainees and so on. Uh, the answers weren't very satisfactory, and we had, uh, uh, w which led the Commission to make a quite, I admit, a, a rather extraordinary request, but uh, the staff of the Commission and the Commissioners felt very strongly about this, that to evaluate the credibility of the uh, detainees, we needed ha to have an opportunity uh, to have our staff actually interview uh, the high-level detainees uh, who were involved in the plot ourselves, or failing that, and I never thought the CIA would let us do that, uh, failing that, we should at least have the opportunity to submit questions uh, that the interrogators, the CIA interrogators would ask these guys, and to go watch the interrogations through one-way glass or an adjoining room or something like that, so that we would have our, uh, and we had a, a very skilled former prosecutor running our 9-11 plot team on our staff, so he could look uh, uh, Abu Zubaydah and KSM in the eye and see whether they were telling the truth or not. Uh, the, uh, uh, George Tenet turned us down on that. There then was, the Commission felt strongly about this, there was a summit conference at the White House on this that Kane and Hamilton went to with, uh, uh, Gonzalez and Tenet and uh, Rumsfeld, uh, and uh, we, uh, they said no and uh, assured us that they would give us whatever they could. Uh, we had discussions with them about what was available, and we were never told about the videotapes. And now we're kind of annoyed, uh, to put it mildly, because the CIA, uh, uh, taking a hyper-technical uh, position says, well, you never specifically asked in a document request for videotapes. Well, well let me ask you this, uh, though, Dan. If, if you had <coughs> known about the videotapes, if they had told you, would we, you would have asked for them, and they would have said no. That's and correct. And one reason they would have said no is because they would have said, and just turning to the techniques <coughs> themselves, those tapes reveal the CIA's enhanced interrogation techniques, which are classified, and we're not going to tell you what they are or the legal justification for them. Well, we and so you would have had the same problem that Jane Harmon and those in Congress have now with respect to the inability to do anything about overseeing the way the CIA interrogates. Well, but we were not interested in overseeing right. the way the CIA Well, you might have been had you seen these tapes. Maybe. I don't, <laughs> no, we, we actually, in, in the spring of 2003, when Abu Ghraib came out, and then when there were allegations about the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo Bay, the Commission discussed whether we were going to look into that. And we decided that while you could make a, a, a sort of a two steps removed argument as to how that was relevant to our mandate, that it was really pretty peripheral uh, to our mandate, how, the, the, how detainees after 9-11 were being treated by the government. Uh, and that um, uh, we, uh, we wouldn't uh, go into that. And we made that clear to, uh, to the CIA and to the Department of Defense. So what, we, what would have happened if we had known about the videotapes, we would have demanded to see them because we almost, the commission almost went public with its demand to interrogate the, to interview the detainees ourselves. We didn't go public at the CIA's urging. And we settled for a compromise where we submitted questions that they asked the, <laughs> detainees, and then they uh, reported back to us on the answers. Uh, but uh, we would have demanded to see the videotapes, and I don't know what the Commission would have done if uh, uh, George Tenet had said, uh, we're not going to give you the videotapes. Uh, I think the Commission might have uh, gone public on it. We might have made an issue about it. 
Um, okay, let me just uh, turn to the broader issue of oversight, which uh, was very important to the Commission. I think our experience with the CIA and, and this recent incident of the destruction of the tapes sort of underlines for me <clears throat> the importance of congressional oversight of the CIA and the intelligence uh, community generally. And as you know, that's something the Commission uh, felt very strongly about in our recommendations, uh, even before we knew that the videotapes had been destroyed. Uh, and what I think this shows about the CIA is that uh, an intelligence agency like the CIA, and particularly the CIA, which operates abroad, and whose business it is, whose, uh, is to operate in secret and to do lots of things that are illegal, that would be illegal if done by the CIA in the United States. That's, that's their business. That's their charter. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, that, that creates a culture of secrecy, of lack of candor, of lack of forthcomingness. Uh, and I don't, don't mean this uh, in any way to prejudge what happened in, in, in this case. Uh, that makes it particularly important uh, for the Congress to do a good job of overseeing these agencies. Uh, and as uh, uh, Fritz Schwartz said, I mean, some of the oversight uh, has to be done uh, uh, in secret, in, in closed hearings, uh, but some of it can be done in public. Uh, and uh, the Commission felt very strongly that the failures of the intelligence agencies before 9-11 and, of course, we've seen some failures of the intelligence agency since 9-11, too, particularly with respect to the WMD uh, in Iraq issue, um, were attributable both to their failings and also to the, failing, the failure of Congress to effectively exercise its oversight responsibilities. And we made a number of recommendations, the main one of which, which isn't getting anywhere on the Hill, uh, is to strengthen the Senate and House Intelligence Committees by giving them appropriations authority as well as uh, oversight authority. Uh, because, uh, and I think our Chairman uh, Lee Hamilton, who served on the in House Intelligence Committee and was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, or whatever it's called, uh, I can never remember which one is Foreign Affairs and which one is Foreign Relations. Uh, the uh, 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 knows uh, the uh, the the uh, intelligence agencies uh, have not been subject to effective oversight. The kinds of problems that the 9/11 Commission found, and that other uh, that the Silberman Rob Commission found with respect to the performance of the intelligence agencies were not effectively identified and dealt with by the Congress before 9/11. And uh, I'd like to I'd like to bring in our other panelists yeah. on this question. So um, um, David Rifkin, in particular, David um, is a partner at, Baker, at um, Baker and Hostetler here in Washington and was an official in both the Bush 41 and Reagan White Houses in various capacities. And I think that David believes that the current system of oversight with principal reliance on the gang of foreign gang of eight dis disclosures to those small categories of legislators, but telling them that they cannot share the information with anyone else, is both appropriate and adequate and might be even if the intel committees were given the power of appropriations, which they could use as something of a cudgel if they thought something was illegal. And I, I guess I want to ask David, Let's say you were one of the gang of four or one of the gang of eight, and you got information from the, an administration, we are doing X, described at a broad level of generality. Our lawyers have determined that X is legal. It seems to you dubious, questionable, but you're not certain. You don't have the expertise, and it hasn't been vetted through 50 lawyers like it has in the executive branch. They won't show you the legal explanations. They won't give you any of the details on interrogation techniques. What would you do in that case? What, what, if you were part of the Gang of Four or the Gang of Eight, what do, you, what do you do in that situation? Thank you, Marty. It's always a great prerogative of, the, uh, of a moderator, a law professor, to, to pose 
difficult question. I'm not going to duck it. I'm going to answer. But let me just very briefly reflect on the observations of both uh, Marty and uh, and uh, your early observation as well as, as, as Fritz's observation. Look, I think it is fair to acknowledge, and I'm probably someone to the right of Marcus, who at least I think acknowledges that there's a price to be paid for revealing uh, intelligence secrets, whether it's historical nature, more attenuated than going forward on current basis, quite, quite, quite risky, quite costly. It doesn't mean that things are not overclassified. I've certainly seen evidence of that. But frequently, with all due respect to various august personages and various commissions, they're not always in the best position to determine what is the impact of de declassification, particularly cumulative impact of this piece of intelligence or that piece of intelligence. So in my view, Every time we go for this massive declassification process, but we'd be done for the more orderly process of a church committee, uh, orgy of leaks, a pie committee, uh, more structured process with the 9-11 commission, but nevertheless, you held all the trump cards. You know, then, then, then the bad guys learn about PDBs, uh, President's Daily Briefing, and sort of a, the structure of the, the, the product that's being pushed down the pipeline. There's a price to be paid both vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the jihadist threat, but also vis-a-vis -vis far more serious and intelligent adversaries who are trying to hide things from us. It's a huge price to be paid. We do it, we did it with Pike and Church Committee because there was a serious challenge to the legitimacy of intelligence operations undertaken by the United States government, and let me say with, with good reasons. I would not deny that. Uh, so there was a, a, a huge price that we paid for it. I think the 9-11 Commission mentioned it somewhat more generally than I would have liked about the impact of these hearings, and I'm not saying they were wrong in terms of demoralizing clandestine service in particular and with many other things leading to kind of a weakening of a daring do and, and willingness to take risks. There was a damage done, with all due respect, by the 9-11 Commission report. Had to be done, though, given the, 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 the impact on the nation's psyche what happened on 9-11. So the notion that we should just sort of do more and more and do it on a routine basis, in, in my opinion, is absolutely a horrible idea. You do it as rarely as possible, and you keep the lid on intelligence information as much as possible. On the oversight, look, nothing is, is perfect, but there are, and I'll answer your question in a second, there are conflicting imperatives. We have an unprecedented degree of information sharing on an ongoing basis, both on the statutory basis, but also on the basis of various agreed upon some people in this room know better than I do, agreed upon agreements between the, the relevant, uh, the sissy and the hipsy and the intelligence community. And people are brought in, whether it's Gang of Eight for some things, or Gang of Four or, or staff, unprecedented basis, read into many, 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 many things. If the pendulum swung a bit more towards more disclosure, particularly disclosure not authorized by the executive branch. In my opinion, that would break the back of the current arrangement. You're just not going to be able to function in a situation where it is ultimately the people in the legislative branch who decide what, whether something should be declassified in a sense of either leaking it or, you know, bringing it to the public in a more transparent fashion, all the objections of the executive branch. It just cannot be done. It would, provo it would provoke a constitutional crisis, and I don't think that is what we need. Now, what do you do when you respond to your question, Marty? You scream like hell. You use the bully pulpit. I happen to think, and you very correctly pointed out Jane Harmon's objection, but to be fair, the record shows, and nobody knows for sure, but the record shows, at least in the media, that they're presented with this information about the enhanced interrogation techniques and their use. A number of members of Congress who were read into this program, instead of expressing reservations, express the view that why aren't we doing more, and an absolute overarching emphasis on not enough a 9-11. So to me, the problem with the current political setup and the institutional setup for intelligence oversight isn't necessarily, or not only that it is weak enough to stop the wrongdoing, but it isn't strong enough, with all due respect, to deliver what was the promise of intelligence oversight, which is if you bring us in at the inception, at the takeoff, we'll be with you at the landing because the people on the Hill are manifestly not with the intelligence community as far as the landing is concerned. The very same people who are perfectly happy to do whatever it takes and were pushing the intelligence community to do more are all now like Caesar's wife and don't want to hear anything about it and, and, and chastising the intelligence community. So, and there's an enormous amount of political amnesia involved. I really think that if you had 
people who are willing to be politically courageous, and again, I don't want to say that anybody particularly was not, and, and, and I really think that something has been horribly wrong. You take it to the president, you take it to the vice president, you scheme like hell. You don't write elliptical letters for the record. If you're going to write a letter for the record, Marty, you write a letter for the record which basically says, when it comes out, I want the world to know. But I thought it stunk, I thought it was unlawful, and I thought it was wrong. You know what? With all due respect, based upon everything I know, no such letters were written because nobody wanted, particularly in the early post-September 11 days, nobody wanted to stick, stick their necks out. David, I, I guess I agree with that, and I've, I've criticized Representative Harmon for the elliptical nature of her. I was more thinking about a certain senator and not, not of, her, of her letter and, and Senator Rockefeller for his even more oblique letter to the vice president. Um, but isn't that, doesn't that demonstrate the problem that they're, the folks who would really be able to bring expertise and knowledge to bear on the question of the legality of these techniques were not let in on them. There couldn't be a public debate about them. And it, it remains un, not apparent to me why we can't have a debate about what techniques are legal and very, which aren't very, very the brief, way we have in the, in the very, Defense very Department. Very brief answer. Uh, with all due respect, I think the ultimate questions are political questions. The ultimate questions are not legal questions, and these are very tough, politically dicey questions because at certain times nobody wants to be wimpy and, and, and nobody wants to do less than necessary to protect our security. And other times the pendulum pushes back towards the individual rights protection. And you cannot fix, it is the biggest myth that you can fix the enhanced ability of a system to clear political issues by doing more lawyering. I have done as much as anybody on an unclassified basis looking at the legal issues involved. And reasonable people can disagree. But ultimately, the tough issues are not legal issues. The tough issues is what does this country is willing to do in paying political price in terms of our reputation overseas to obtain intelligence from people using techniques that even fall well short of torture and criminal indicating treatment. Do we want to do that or not? This is not a legal issue. How are you going to goose the political system to process this well, better? David, David I, think, I think this is a great setup for our final speaker, Elisa Massimino, who's the general counsel of Human Rights First, which has actually published what is, to my mind, the best single um, concise document um, describing the legal, you know, analyzing the legal questions of which techniques are lawful and which are not under the various, very specific legal and very thorough legal restrictions that have been put in place by Congress and by treaties and by the Constitution. Um, and Elisa's um, organization, Human Rights First, certainly does not think that whether waterboarding is torture is a political question. She thinks, as I, I do, that it is very much a legal question that should be subject to public debate. So with that, I will turn it over to Elisa. Well, it does bring us back to, uh, um, you know, we wouldn't have had to write the chapter on waterboarding in that uh, in that report if uh, people had been able to see the videotapes. I mean, this gets us back to this question about the, about the videotapes. Um, there is, as Fritz suggested, a, a relationship between revelation and reform. So, David, you're talking about, you know, it's a political question, what the American people can, can stomach, uh, what we're willing to do, um, and, and, what we're, and what we won't do uh, as Americans is related to what, you know, the underlying conduct that was depicted on those tapes. You, know, you can talk about waterboarding. Um, it's a very different thing um, than seeing it. And, and I think, you know, if you, if you I, pay attention to the timeline here. Um, the, the tapes were destroyed in November of 2005, three years after the, the, the conduct that's depicted on them took place. What was going on in November of 2005? Do you remember? The Senate had just passed the McCain Amendment. There was a vigorous debate going on in Congress about the ban on cruel and human and degrading treatment, um, whether or not that would apply to the CIA as well as the military, getting people back onto the standards of the Army Field Manual. And the Vice President was engaged in a pitched battle trying to carve out exceptions uh, for the CIA from the ban on cruel and human and degrading treatment. And that's when the tapes were destroyed. The CIA must have known at that time that there was eroding political support for a program of enhanced interrogation techniques. Now, I, I think the investigation into the destruction of the tapes is important. I think what Congress is going to do here is extremely important. Um, and, you know, I have my own views about how, how the Justice Department investigation ought to be set up. I think it's not uh, that that 
no matter how much integrity this individual prosecutor has, he is embedded in a chain of command that is infected with conflicts of interest because at every level the Justice Department was involved in vetting the conduct that you see on the tapes. So I think that that's not an investigation that's likely to get at what I think is more important even than the question of the illegality of the destruction of the tapes themselves. You know, ever since Abu Ghraib, we have seen the accountability mechanisms here. Everything flows downstream. You know, at Abu Ghraib, there was one death at Abu Ghraib, and there were pictures of it, of the man after he died. The ice man, they call him, because he was packed in ice. And there were soldiers who took pictures. Those soldiers are serving time right now. The people who were involved in killing that prisoner are not. And, you know, if these investigations, congressional and the executive branch, do their jobs, then finally this pattern of, you know, punishing the monkey and letting the organ grinder go will be broken. That's what we need to have. And, you know, I really do think that it's a little bit, David, problematic to say, you know, this is a political question when the details about what the public needs in order to make decisions about this are withheld. I mean, I really think that, you know, the reason why those tapes are destroyed is that people who knew what was on them, who had seen them, knew what we know, that any American, any 9-11 prosecutor who watched what was happening in the interrogation, but any decent American would know when they saw that, that that is conduct that shocks the conscience under the legal standard and is not permitted. But we don't have the benefit of that because of the destruction of the tapes. So I know that there are costs to revelations. But if, you know, if the CIA wants to avoid another church committee style overhaul and investigation, what it ought to do is ask, instead of oppose, Congress to enact the Intelligence Authorization Bill that has this provision that would bring the CIA interrogations into the standards set out in the Army Field Manual. That is a way to restore confidence. And I really think it's the only way, is to address the underlying conduct here. I just want to see, I'm not sure it's the only way, because I do want to keep in the air the idea of Representative Holt's bill to require videotaping and evidence, which would be a great boon to the intelligence community, as well as a check on illegal conduct. Each of you has indicated to me that you have strong reactions to something someone else has said. So without trying to predict what those might be, I'll just go down the line, starting with Fritz. Well, actually, some of what David said I agreed with, but I would reach a very different ultimate conclusion. First, I think he's right that the kind of massive investigation that the Church Committee had and the 9-11 Commission had ought to be rare, and very rare. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be, along the way, effective oversight by the Congress. And secondly, I think you were right, David, in saying that the ultimate questions are political, you said, not legal. I would say are policy, not legal. But where does, where, if you accept those two things, are we today in a situation where we need, as a country, a major investigation of how the intelligence agencies have conducted themselves since 9-11, pursuant to the instructions of the White House? And I think the answer to that question is definitely that we do, for two reasons. The first is, we want to win the battle against the bin Ladens of the world. And it is my thesis that the tactics that the Bush administration has adopted, where we have adopted the tactics of the enemy, have actually substantially hurt us in the effort to overcome the bin Ladens of the world. Now, that view of mine may be right or may be wrong, 
but that is a matter which is of enormous policy importance. And the second reason why I think we today are ripe for another major look at what has been done is because the whole theory of the actions of the Bush administration is a truly revolutionary constitutional theory, which has no precedent in American history and is, in my judgment again, but others should look at that, <coughs> utterly inconsistent with our Constitution and with our history since 1787. And that is the theory that the President has the right to break the law. Now, that is the basis on which the Bush administration has decided it, it can commit torture, and it's silly to keep accepting the, the euphemism enhanced interrogation techniques. What they're talking about, even though they deny it, clearly is torture. And the theory under which they say they're entitled to use torture and entitled to do warrantless wiretapping is that the president has the right to break the law. That's something which, if true, is a radical change in America. It's something which ought to be, as a policy matter, debated on the basis of facts. And that's why I think we are in the rare, picking David's word, situation where it does merit a major analysis done responsibly in the way that the 9-11 Commission and the Church Committee did theirs. Okay, I'm going to turn to Dan. Before I do, I just wanted to say, although obviously I agree with Fritz that one of the most important legal questions of this administration is the claim that the Commander-in-Chief can disregard statutory and treaty-based law um, in the conduct of war. The, more, more recently, the administration has, has sort of <coughs> tended away from that argument and argued instead that under a you know, a proper construction of the torture statute or the due process clause or the McCain Amendment or the cruel treatment prohibition of common Article 3, that waterboarding does not, it is not intended to result in severe physical suffering, for instance, um, something that the Attorney General is apparently reviewing himself, although it's taking him an awful long time to figure out what to many of us seems to be quite apparent. And the problem here is that we don't, is, is that the administration has refused to make public the legal documents and the legal reasoning by which the, it has claimed that these techniques are not torture or, or, are, or, or are defensible under an Article II theory. Just one uh, sentence on there, the, I, that it's not torture. We prosecuted Japanese soldiers after World War II because they used waterboarding. So it's a crime for the Japanese soldiers to do it, and it's okay for America to do it? Well, the Director of Intelligence, Mr. McConnell, has recently been quoted by Lawrence Wright as saying that if waterboarding was inflicted on him, it would be torture. Um, but he was careful to qualify if it was done to him. Um, I do want, one, I do want a, one little caveat, which is the sort of church committee, you know, broad oversight of the intelligence community I think the intelligence community, for good reason, is very wary of that prospect, in part because of what happened here, which is that they've become the agents in the executive branch who are very cautious and very legalistic. Many in the Central Intelligence Agency wanted no part of these enhanced interrogation techniques, and it was the political actors who were f pushing them to do this, and, and the lawyers within the administration. And so I think if we ever have this sort of a review of what's gone on in intelligence in the Bush administration, its focus will be, le I hope it will be less on the operational folks and the so-called rogue agents and more on the policy decisions that were made at the highest Absolutely levels. right. The, the key question is the responsibility at the top, which is either, uh, it's either done by a wink and a nod or it's done by intentionally not knowing certain things, but that's the key question. Or by hundreds of pages of OLC opinions, yes. Dan. Well, I certainly agree. We ought to see more of OLC opinions public. Um, I want to respond to a little to what David said about the uh, Gang of Eight or Gang of Four process. Um, I think we ha there, there's no question that it's important to keep a lot of the information that goes to the Gang of Four or the Gang of Eight about covert action and other matters secret. Uh, just as it was important to keep a lot of the information that went to the 9-11 Commission, 10 commissioners and dozens of staff people secret. But the fact is that we do have to take certain risks with respect to secrecy to make our government work. And I think experience shows that 
the, the, with, you know, there have been some problems, but in general, the intelligence committees, the members of the intelligence committees and their staffs do a very good job of keeping secret information secret, <coughs> just as the 9-11 Commission did, just as the Church Committee did. And to me, I think, and I have not been a part of the uh, intelligence community or the, uh, I've never communicated with the Gang of Four or the Gang of Eight, but just from observing uh, the, the kind of uh, things we've read about and heard about in the last few years, it seems to me the Gang of Eight process is not working as well as it should. And uh, it uh, seems to me that it would work a lot better. Uh, one, I th hopefully the people who are members of the Gang of Four or Gang of Eight will learn from recent experiences and, and do a better job uh, of, uh, uh, of receiving and digesting and acting on information that they receive. Uh, there are things that can be done uh, besides writing elliptical letters uh, to the Vice President. Uh, but I also think that the national security would not be imperiled uh, by providing more information to all members of the Intelligence Committee and to s at least uh, a few senior staff people. I don't, uh, and maybe I'm naive, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't see why uh, the uh, senior uh, staff people on the Senate and House Intelligence Committees can't uh, get the information that the Gang of Eight gets. David will tell me why. David, what, do you think the senior staff <clears throat> people who know the law better maybe than the members do should have access to, say, the OLC opinions on enhanced interrogation techniques? Um, well, I was going to answer affirmatively until I heard the last part of a sentence. I, uh, I think uh, – Any OLC opinions. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that there's nothing were up to me. There would be nothing wrong with allowing a few senior staff members, chief of staff, uh, general counsel, Hibsian, and Sissy to have access to the same information but the gang of four, gang of eight gets, whether we should have access as a matter of right to OLC opinions, no one hell no, whether we should have access as a matter of comity and appropriate circumstances, it is, of course, yes. Let me very briefly, I wish I had 20 minutes, provide some different reflection on a couple of key points that have been made here. Look, um, I don't want to suggest that only questions we have are policy questions. They are legal questions, and Lisa and I, and, some of probably you, Marty, and I have been over some of those issues before. Yes, there are some legal issues and tough legal issues, uh, and I hate to defend waterboarding. I'm not going to do it today, but let me tell you the argument on the other side. We somehow got to the point where we lacked the political maturity to honestly debate interrogation issues because if you look at the statutory language and the debates about what are the proper uh, interrogating technique. Not only it doesn't talk about waterboarding, it doesn't even discuss things in details. It talks in such gentle euphemisms as, why don't we follow the same procedures there? I mean, field manual, ladies and gentlemen, I read it several times. Let me give you one example. There's a, something called Mutton Jeff, a good cop, bad cop routine that's routinely deployed in police stations in this country where, you know, the bad cop is pretty bad. No physical violence, but lots of psychological intimidation. If you, I challenge you to read the Mutton Jeff technique discussion in the military interrogation manual, most recently classified version, which suggests that even the bad cop can look stern but cannot humiliate, challenge, or intimidate in any way the detainee. So what we have is a kindler, gentler version of a Mutt and Jeff technique that people are suggesting be used against high-value detainees. Okay, if that's what you want, let's have an honest debate about it. Don't hide behind the language in the Army Fuel Manual. Let's have an honest debate and say no coercion. We're going to treat high-value enemy detainees, combatants, better when we treat criminal suspects and better when we treat criminal defendants in our state and federal penitentiaries who, by the way, are not treated that, that gently. I remember my days of a Justice Department, one of the less pleasant tasks was investigating allegations of abuse against Federal Bureau of Prisons, which I'm sorry to say are not always untrue. So uh, people in federal and state penitentiaries are treated a hell of a lot worse than people will be treated under these rules. The, so that is what I say. The political system is broken down. There's no honesty, there's no integrity in, in debating those issues. The solution to me, again, if it were up to me, I would, and this administration made a proposal, who knows how sincere they were, in the beginning of, of the president's second term, which sounded like they wanted to actually have a form of a privy council, where they would bring people from 
the congressional leadership more into internal executive branch deliberations, not only about interrogation techniques, but many things. Never was fleshed out about what the rules were, what would cover only intelligence issues, the use of force issues, other things. But you know what? We never got to that point because everybody in Congress, including the Speaker and the Majority Leader, backpedal from that idea so fast your head would spin because nobody wants accountability because the problem with being brought into this process is if you gauge things wrong, either one way or the other, you pay a horrible price, and no politician likes that. So I would have no problems bringing people in. I would have no problems having the president, not as a man of obligation. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, afraid tonight and probably everybody else in this panel fundamentally disagree about how aberrant this administration's view of executive power is. By the way, nobody ever said the president has the right to disregard any statute. The president has the right to disregard unconstitutional statutes, which is not a view unique to this administration. It's a view espoused by a number of administrations. And the best articulation of it, by the way, is from Bill Clinton or C's opinion. But forget all the law. I would have no problems having the president say, I'm going to bring key congressional leaders, and I would give you a presumptive commitment that if they all disagree with me, I would follow the advice except in exceptional circumstances. So you can give Congress, it has to be leaders, it cannot be all of them, a huge stake in decision making. But with the power comes responsibility. That is the most fundamental organizing principle of our constitutional system. And my huge problem with the critics, and Congress in particular, they want all the power and no accountability. And you cannot work around that, and you cannot pretend that it's a legal issue. There are some legal issues, but legal issues are dwarfed by political issues. And no better demonstration of that, I'm repeating myself, than inability of a critics of administration interrogation techniques to honestly say what, what they want is not just no waterboarding, which I would agree to, but no coercion whatsoever. No yelling, no screaming, no humiliating language. If that's what they want, let them say that. Well, I think we finally found Marty. some common ground because um, Elisa and I, among others, agree that there should be transparency and that the uh, legislative representative should also take, take account um, and be counted on, on these sorts of questions and that we should have a public debate. Unfortunately, if we never get the documents or the videotapes, we won't be able to have that debate. But, Elisa, why don't you give your very, comments? Very, very briefly. And then yeah. I want to spend five minutes because we only have less than a half an hour left Five minutes um, on the question of special counsel with respect to the DOJ investigation of the tapes, and then maybe open it up for some questions. From Good. The I'm, I'm eager for the questions. But um, David knows what I think of his argument about the Army Field Manual, um, but you don't, so I have to take just a minute <laughs> to say um, – and, and actually, you don't need to hear what I think of that argument. Um, if you read uh, the letter from General Petraeus from, uh, from about nine months ago to the troops, it's quite clear. I mean, I, David's not an interrogation expert, neither am I. Um, but the current head of the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, said he doesn't need anything in order to interrogate al Qaeda than what's in the Army Field Manual. And General Petraeus said, there's no need to go beyond the Army Field Manual. It's sophisticated. It was just revised uh, just over a year ago based on current uh, lessons learned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and uh, I, I would say that if there are jurisdictions in the United States where people are being treated worse than that, then we need to have an investigation into those places, too. Okay. So now I would uh, – Mark, can I just – Well – 30 – 10 seconds. I really don't think it's fair to rely on anybody. It's in English. Go read it and see what it says I'd, about the modern yes, jet technique and, and reach your own conclusion. Because it's not fair to ask senior officers, honorable as they are, who want to be promoted, who understand political correctness, who wouldn't have gotten there if not they understanding political correctness, what they think about the most radioactive political issues. So let's I didn't not ask him. He wrote well, that But, to but let's not rely on that. Yeah, okay. In fairness, the, the issue, I, I, I'll interject, is, is not about Mutt and Jeff or about yelling. It's about waterboarding and hypothermia and stress positions and severe sensory and sleep deprivation and threats to the detainees and their families. Um, some of us think those things are already illegal and should remain so. But having said that, I think David's absolutely right that not enough legislators have come forward, in part because they're fearful that they will be accused of revealing classified information if they start discussing this, but also because of cowardice and, and uncertainty. Having said this, so let me spend five minutes on the question, which I think is fairly academic but might turn out to be important, about whether Attorney General Mukasey should give um, Mr. Durham or some other prosecutor more independence in the investigation of the um, CIA tape destruction. Um, 
David, I'll start with you. I, I know you think not, and then I'll give Elisa a couple minutes, and if either of our other panelists want to speak to that question as well. I'll be very brief. I've written, actually, a piece for Wall Street Journal about a week ago arguing that it's a very good decision. We are talking about a situation which, by the way, totally different from the past. There are no political, senior political people involved. The political people actually, by all accounts, advocated against it. We're talking about career people. We're talking about offices and clandestine service. We're talking about them acting, at least in my view, presumptively in good faith in, in getting the tapes because the explanation I've heard and other people heard is they frankly wanted nothing wrong with that. They wanted to protect themselves. They're not used to in these types of techniques. Uh, they're dealing with people whom we didn't know very well in their medical conditions. They wanted to document the fact that they were complying with the damn techniques in addition to the intelligence value. They went and got legal opinions. They did everything by the book. Okay. If you're basically going to take the position that the behavior of career people in an intelligence community or law enforcement community always needs to be investigated for the special counsel route, which if you look at the Patrick Fitzgerald model, pretty much an independent counsel, complete severance of any political oversight, complete severance of any prosecutorial discretion, discretion decisions being exercised by anybody else, then what have we come to? I mean, uh, why is it in this circumstances? And by the way, just like with the 9-11 the committee and Franklin Church Committee, there's a price to be paid. We can all agree with that, I hope, for special and independent counsel setups. Same person. It's not a question of person. You, you take somebody like Durham and put him in a position where he can consult with nobody except people whom you hired, work for him, cannot go to his peers, cannot go to his peers, cannot ask for broader input because you get sucked up into investigation after doing that for a while. And you would exercise prosecutorial discretion one way. You put him in the normal channels and you would exercise the prosecutorial discretion differently. The special slash independent counsel model has a big price to pay. Sometimes it's necessary. But why is it necessary here? And especially it's not necessary in addition to the, the, the range of people involved if we're clear about what we're investigating. When that's the in the tape destruction, I don't think even Marty would suggest that that needs a special counsel. But no, the critics say we need to investigate the interrogation techniques and a whole host of other issues and you know, abuses by the Bush administration. Why have we come in the 21st century to the point that these issues have to be done for the rubric of criminal investigation? If Congress wants to have a contentious debate with the executive branch in the oversight context, okay. At least I understand the logic of it. But why do you want to run it through the rubric of a, of a criminal investigation? That, to me, further attests, Marty, to the warping of a normal political discourse. And if you don't do that, if you're doing tape destruction, then why do you need an independent counsel? Special Rounds, the last point, there's nothing wrong with political input as long as it's accountable. To me, I salute the Attorney General for willingness, presumably at the back end, to involve himself and the deputy, whether they agree with Durham, and I'm 99.99% .99 certain it would be his decision. But the fact that they're willing to partake some of the blame or some of the credit for it is a commendable thing. That's how democracy is supposed to work. To me, shuffling things off the way it was done by Comey, frankly speaking, and, and, and the Attorney General Ashcroft is a sign of political, well, what's the polite word, lack of courage, not a, a sign of, of political commendation. Why, why, why is that a good thing? I, I, just because time is short. Elisa, do you want to respond I, quickly? I, or I, I want to just say, because I want to stop you, because I heard something I agreed with. So I just want to note <laughs> it for the, and that is that, uh, that is very welcome that the Attorney General decided to act on this and to and, and, and announce an investigation. I, I do think, we differ though because I, I um, in addition to the, the, the breadth of the mandate, I mean I clearly, you heard me, I, I believe that, uh, that the investigation needs to extend to the lawfulness of the conduct depicted on the tapes. But even if it didn't, I think that the independence of the investigation and even the, 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 the you know, the question on the merits of the lawfulness of the destruction of the tapes and the decision to destroy them and all of that is tied up with the legality, a judgment about the legality of the conduct depicted on the tapes. And for that, I think um, you have to get outside of that. There's just, too, there's just too much involvement at the Justice Department in so many different ways on the question of the legality of that conduct. So that, that's, that's my view. And, and I, I'm going to open it to the audience now. I'm, I'm, 
before I do so, I want to just state I think I'm somewhere between David and Elisa on this, and that regardless of what the right answer is as to the scope of the Justice Department investigation, it does seem to me that the con Congressional Intelligence Committees would be better off spending more of their time uh, investigating two questions. One, wh wh what, what went on on those tapes? What, what happened? What were the techniques that were used? And what should the lawful techniques be going forward? And should they be required to be videotaped? And I, I mean, think that's something that maybe David would agree with. I actually would agree with it with one small caveat. I think that the committee should look at their own behavior in this episode, a little self-reflection to see what they've done in the course of interactions with intelligence community that may have contributed to what has happened. Um, unless my fellow panelists have something else, I'm going to open it up. Could I um, request that members of the press ask their questions first, because I'm told a couple of them were on deadline and wanted to make sure they got in. Sir, uh, do you want folks to identify themselves? Well, um, Go. In a parallel issue, Could you I identify yourself? <laughs> I, I was going to take questions from press first. Is that okay? This one. Any? Go ahead. Uh, Marty, you made the point that many in the intelligence community were reluctant to get in, <clears throat> into the, these interrogation techniques. And I mean, my question is, how do we ensure? I mean, we have public has no control over the, the DOJ investigation, but Congress presumably is, is a political. Is something that is subject to political pressure. How do we ensure that this investigation is, does not just repeat what happened in all the previous ones of other grades and so forth, where the, the policy questions, the policy makers, are let totally free on this thing, and it ends up being the, the operatives? Uh, I mean, I certainly have been told, and presumably you have too, that there were many people in CIA and elsewhere who did not want to do this stuff, did not want to be stuck in this position again among other reasons, remembering the church meeting. Uh, and the policy, and there's no doubt, I don't think at this point, that the policy came particularly from the Office of the Vice President and, you know, secondarily justice and some civilians and DOD. But you're, you're talking now about the, about the techniques themselves. Whereas the, the decision... The, the, the policy right, to use right, those right. techniques. Whereas the, I think... Um, Durham's investigation is limited, it appears to be, to the destruction of the tapes. And from what we know so far, it seems that the higher-ups simply were giving winks and nods and mild advice rather than prohibitions. Sure. That's and why I'm asking about the Congress, because Congress can, is not bound by the mandate <clears throat> you know, given to, uh, to the special counsel or whatever he is. Congress certainly has the, the liberty to go to the policy questions so far they refuse to do that, they decline to do it. Well, let me ask Dan, um, in the congressional investigations of the tape destruction, um, and Fritz as well, I suppose, uh, is it odd to you that this investigation is being, the, the one thing Congress could add, it seems to me, is, is some sort of political accountability of misconduct, not of the folks who made the ultimate decision, but of those who failed to prohibit them from doing so, or who winked and nodded. Does it trouble you that this is being done behind closed doors? Why isn't this investigation being done in open hearings? Well, I certainly think, uh, and I, I guess I agree with, with an emerging consensus here, that uh, Congress is the body that really ought to be investigating the administration's policies with respect to uh, interrogation techniques. And to, we should recognize, of course, Congress has done some things in this area, uh, with the Detainee Treatment Act and with the Military Commissions Act. They're imperfect uh, and uh, they're subject to signing statements and things like that, but it's, it's obvious to me it's Congress's role and I agree with Marty. I think, while you have to be careful if you have a public hearing, uh, that Congress, uh, and I think the model that uh, the Church Committee used of combining uh, closed and public hearings on an issue like this, uh, is a very effective one. And you can work these things out in advance in, in consultation uh, with the administration. The committee tells the, uh, the CIA and the uh, Justice Department and the, uh, the White House, whomever, uh, here's what we plan to do. And you reach a protocol as to what's going to be done in closed hearing and what's going to be done uh, in open hearing. Uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, the, the issue of the appropriate 
interrogation techniques, while obviously there are legal questions as to what's legal under the law or not, is best pursued by congressional investigation rather than criminal, uh, criminal investigation and prosecution because people say, well, gee, should we hold uh, the higher-ups responsible for endorsing uh, interrogation techniques that may be illegal? Well, the fact is, for better or worse, uh, from all that we can tell, those higher-ups believe, perhaps wrongly, that the interrogation techniques they were blessing uh, were legal. I mean, John, you wrote that opinion, and I think it's sort of crazy to think uh, that there should be an investigation as to whether uh, he broke the law by interpreting the torture statute wrong. Uh, it's a very good thing that that OLC opinion was leaked and became public, so that we understand what the legal rationale was and could, and could shoot it down so that the Justice Department felt it had to withdraw that opinion. Uh, but it's not a matter for criminal investigation or prosecution. Okay. Fritz, well, Fritz, one thing I was interested in your opening statement um, was that all of the information the Church Committee was given, if we agree that, that these hearings could be largely open to the public with occasional executive session for truly important classified information. Well, from the administration's perspective, it's all classified. And they tell the members of Congress, you can't talk about any of this. And what I found really intriguing was that this is what you were told in the church committee as well. This is all classified. And then you guys made your own decision about what could go in the thousand pages of... Uh, yeah, we, you we, didn't we, just we gave them, to the... No, we, we gave them a chance to object and maybe some percentage of the cases they were right, but we had the ultimate power. But I, that's I think a big the, difference. Sure, right? sure, sure. I, I think the, the special counsel question opens up another number of things. And I agree, I would not uh, say here you need a special counsel because there's an attorney general, he's accountable. Uh, McKay, while his second day of hearings were very disappointing, he's, he's politically someone who's free from domination, I believe, by the politicians. But it's important because of the nature of the case that if they decide against prosecution, that that decision be completely transparent and its reasoning in exact words be given to the public. The other thing is Congress, sometimes Congress is told you shouldn't uh, go ahead with your investigation because there's actually a pending criminal matter. Um, that should not stop Congress from operating here. And I also agree with you, Dan. The, the congressional investigation is much more important ultimately than a criminal investigation. And with a criminal investigation, you have all kinds of questions about is it fair to, is it fair to some CIA person who used a technique which would make us all disgusted is it fair to punish that person criminally when there was an opinion saying you can go ahead and do that stuff? I, I doubt very much that it is. So Congress, for all these reasons, is the body that's the right body to have the broad investigation. And then, then that raises, of course, at some point, um, Jose Rodriguez's lawyer, perhaps Porter Goss's lawyer, tell Congress we're not going to testify unless you give us complete immunity from criminal prosecution. And that's a that's a tough a, a tough decision on the part of the committees, isn't it? It, it is. Can I just say one thing very briefly? It is a tough decision, and actually, you know, not remarkable. I'm perfectly happy in, in favor of congressional investigation. We have to be honest here. The how of investigation is structured. What is it looking at? The way it's going right now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is kind of Let's look at the, at the legal opinions. Let's parse and reparse, you know, common article free and all this other stuff. Let's go out to the lawyers. Why couldn't we have more of a policy discourse about what coercion does and doesn't do? Is it really effective? There are people, at least, and hundreds of other people say it's not necessary. There are people who feel differently. How do you balance possible gains in, in, in actionable intelligence versus damage to our reputation? And let's have a serious debate about it instead of playing the game of gotcha, because let's face it, one of the reasons the administration hasn't released the legal opinions is not, Marty, as you all know, because of classification issues, even though it is. The subsequent OC opinions, beyond the engrossed one that was withdrawn, do discuss facts, how you investigate. It has to be that. But beyond that, we're talking about making it difficult for lawyers in the future administration to come up with candid opinions because they know their names would be dragged through the mud a couple of years down the road. Their careers would be, would be ruined. 
and they'll be held to scorn and ridicule and, and you know, moved for disbarment by various people and, 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 and sued on various frivolous grounds. We are creating an environment where you truly demoralize and debilitate the ability of any president, Republican or Democrat, to get candid advice. I mean, that's we, not a we, myth, we, that's we, a reality. We, well, I actually would dispute that. We only have 10 minutes left, and I want to take more questions. That's but no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, when, I, when I worked at OLC, um, for Walter Dellinger, our, our mantra was that we should write opinions on the assumption that they could appear on the front page of the Washington Post. That made us better, more careful lawyers giving better legal advice than if we thought that our advice would not be made public one day. I'm, I think it's perfectly appropriate. Um, Scott. Excuse me, for the New York Times. I, I, um, I know you don't want to talk or, or you talk with, uh, about the legality of destroying the tapes or the legal issues there, but, uh, but I wonder if you could comment on the, the fix that Attorney General McCasey finds himself in when he's sort of promised to say at some point what he feels about waterboarding, uh, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it's torture. Um, I, it does seem to me that his dilemma uh, reflects one that is behind a lot of the behavior that we're talking about today, uh, which is that certain things were done with high-level approval in 2002. In practice, the administration has steadily moved away from those things. They haven't waterboarded since 2003, but there were, as, as we believe, there were uh, legal opinions in 2005 justifying the things that were done in 2002. The tapes were destroyed in 2005 that presumably show the waterboarding. All this is, is sort of uh, trying to preserve uh, the legality or, or uh, you know, preserve the, the, uh, the immunity of the people who, who did that in 2002. That's, that seems to me the real bind. I just wonder, what does this look like from your case's point of view? I, I'm, I'm going to try that one myself. Um, I've written, and I think this is right, that I was surprised when Casey didn't say the following in his hearing that waterboarding is torture and is unlawful, but he promises that anyone who did it in reliance upon OLC opinions will not be prosecuted. Wasn't that the easy way out? Now, Scott, I think you've, it's not because of potential criminal exposure that he didn't do that. I think it's two other reasons. I think first, because in order to find that waterboarding is torture, he would have had to repudiate the rationale of the OLC opinions lurking behind it, namely that severe physical uh, suffering um, must be prolonged. And if he repudiated that, it would mean the end of other techniques that have become controversial. It would be hard to single out waterboarding. And the second reason, I think, is because it would mean that he would be saying that folks like Steve Bradbury had given bad, transparently wrong legal advice, and now the administration is continuing to you know, push for the appointment of Steve Bradbury, and it puts Mukasey in a very tough position to be saying, I want the Senate to confirm someone whose legal advice I think was completely wrong-headed. Yeah, but that's what he, exactly what he should be doing. He should call it as he sees it. No, but get, wherever it, wherever the case this is. I'm, highly, I'm just trying to respond to Scott. Why isn't but he let doing me, that? Let me see, think these right, are this is why. one possible interpretation that the legal advice was palpably, demonstrably wrong. You know, so wrong that it was a first-year law student's exam, you would get an F. Well, with all due respect to Marty and everybody, this ain't necessarily so. It is entirely possible, Scott, for the executive branch, and I've gone for this exercise in other contexts, to take a different, you, you look at the given statute, you slice it, you say, look, there are some things that are clearly barred by the statute, and they have some zone of discretion, you know, in the regulatory law code, Chevron discretion, and there are many interpretations of a statute. As long as they're all within the zone of reason, one is the best, number 10 is the worst, you, you as the agency flip back and forth among interpretations, you have to go through, you know, certain organizational steps to get there, but it doesn't mean, quite aside from the point that you and I to hold anybody retroactively liable criminally, which would be unthinkable, you don't say we messed up and now this is the right interpretation. You just say we shifted, we re-exercised our discretion. We don't even need to opine on the issue of whether or not the previous exercise was wrong because the United States is a sovereign and Justice Department and OLC as a body should not be in the business of sort of promiscuously repudiating yourself. Well, you say, I, I, well, I, actually, I actually, it's, it's, not permi it's not promiscuous. No, it's, if it's, you don't need to do that, if you don't need to do that, you can shift to another interpretation, you can buttress it, and you don't have to say anything about what happened in the past. That is a perfectly defensible position. Justice does it all the time. Environment mm -hmm. division does it. Tax division does it. Antitrust division does it. 
OC does it too. The mea culpas are not legally compelled mea culpas. The mea culpas that people are asking for are politically driven mea culpas. Yeah, I, I think that uh, your, that approach is justifiable in some situations, but here it's crazy. I mean, here where the original opinion had already been withdrawn by the Justice Department at the end of 2004, I, mean, I was shocked to learn that in 2005, uh, OLC was giving opinions uh, that was still trying to defend some of the techniques that were so controversial and which we had stopped using. Uh, and I think that the approach uh, that, that we're going to pay a terrible price if we don't take the approach that uh, our moderator so wisely uh, urges we should have taken already, which is to say, for the Justice Department to say, the earlier opinion was wrong and that uh, these types of uh, techniques uh, are forbidden. It doesn't even, they don't even have to say they're torture. They can say they're cruel and human and degrading treatment. Uh, they, they can uh, do a lot of things, but they can take us out of this uh, terrible bind we are as a policy matter and, and be consistent with the law. Can I, go, Marty, yes, I just... Yes, we have four real, minutes left. One minute, Elisa. Real quick. You're too easy a grader, David, if you don't think that that memo gets an F. But, uh, but to, just to get back to Scott's question, I mean, I think it's, it's a good question because, you know, the, Mukasey is in a bind, and there are, there are limited ways out of it for him. And I think, you know, the, the um, insistence on, which must be with his acquiescence, I would think, uh, of Bradbury again, uh, makes it even harder to have the appearance of, you know, independence of an investigation about this conduct by the Justice Department with Durham in the chain of command. I mean, the Eastern District for also is the place where investigations on detainee abuse go to die, let's face it. Um, and so that's not encouraging either. So I, I think that, you know, one of the ways out of this for Mukasey is to, you know, have Congress be able to do this in a you know open and aggressive way, and to get this uh, investigation outside of the chain of command in uh, inside the Justice Department. Um, can I see hands for further questions? Just two. So can I take those two questions, three, and then our panelists will try to answer them incredibly quickly. So if you could be brief. First, the gentleman against the wall. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. Uh, if Congress is to have more teeth and play a stronger role, there is a weapon, a, an atomic bomb-like weapon that they can use in a parallel issue of the fire prosecutors. The two House, the House and Senate Judiciary Committees have voted to issue subpoenas. It's now before both houses. And if either House, either one independently were to vote to issue a subpoena, well, it may be that the Justice Department would ignore it. But this Justice Department is on the clock. It's going to be there less than a year. And the way things happen, the way things stretched out, it's quite possible that a new Justice Department, free of the political restraints of this one, could actually call a grand jury, and the White House aides could be subpoenaed. Now, once that happens, the cultural block to you, I, I need to get the other two questions. Yeah. So. Well, I just want to ask this panel, is that a, a viable thing to talk about, uh, to get information? Um, you know, literally, the, the subpoena process? Uh, sir. Um, Al Milliken, uh, Washington Post writers. What more have any of you heard from the Federalist Society on how they differ with you, and where do we go from here? And yeah, the front row. And uh, since we've seen that, sort of just briefly, setting aside the issue of interrogation, does anyone on the panel here think that anything was illegal about destroying tapes? Is there any court case or anything you know that would have made it illegal? I will speak as to your question, the third question. I think it completely depends on an array of facts that I don't know enough about in terms of the foresee the, both the existence of judicial orders and the foreseeability of of um, of, uh, of investigations in the future. Um, it's very, very fact intensive. There is also another civil statute at issue. The official, I forget what it's called, but there's a statute, an archive statute that requires the retention. I'm sorry? Federal Records. Federal Records Act, and I haven't seen any explanation for why the destruction didn't violate the Federal Records Act. Although, um, I, I, no, no doubt there are several OLC lawyers right now working on that, on, on that, on that argument. Um, does anyone want to speak to these other two questions? One of which we can turn into, 
you might be right. This might be a question for the next administration's Justice Department. Should, how much, if any, of this should they reveal when they come into power? Just one more thing, Pam, on that question is that the, the, you know, the prosecutors in the Musawi case submitted a sworn affidavit saying that there weren't any, because the, the, there's a question of the materiality of what was on those tapes to the defense in possibly the Padilla case, but, but in the Musawi case. Um, so getting to the, the legality of that, uh, of the destruction itself, but that might be another area in, to look you know, at. The, the bottom line here is, regardless of whether it violated the law to destroy the tapes, it was a really bad idea to do it, and the lawyers at the CIA should have uh, been more forceful in urging, in, in advising their clients not to do it. You don't destroy something when you know that what's happening on those tapes is a matter of great interest to congressional committees. Not to mention the uh, intelligence community. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just say one, one somewhat self-deprecating thing way. because I'm a lawyer. I think it was a mis policy mistake to destroy the tapes. But why, again, are we living in an environment where lawyers who cannot figure out why something is unlawful but think that something is bad are ordering in essence, the structure and exercise of policy discretion by not lawyers. Where, where is it written that's lawyers' function? If I were White House counsel and I told them, bad idea, but I don't think it's illegal, how can I order them not to do it? That's not a problem. Well, the Director of Central Intelligence apparently didn't order them to do anything either. Um, does anyone want to speak to either the Federalist Society or what the next administration could be expected well, well, to do? The only thing about the Federalist Society, I feel somewhat funny since I'm associated with the Federalist Society and often come to speak of those things because it's a spirit of dialogue. I don't think Federalist Society is any different from the uh, – from uh, ACS, both believe passionately in constitutional values and want to have dialogue and discourse about how to advance that. So there's no boogeyman here. Uh, anyone want to speak of the prospects of what might happen in the next administration? <laughs> that, that might be even more fact intensive than the question of, of whether this violated the law. I mean, I can law. tell you what I, what I, what we hope will happen. Um, and it, I'm not going to handicap whether it really will. Uh, and that is that we get in, in order, and this goes back to something you said, uh, Fritz, at the very, very beginning, and that is in, in, in order to right the ship, you do have to understand where we went off course. And so there, there must be a certain amount of truth-telling and, uh, you know, not every classified document has to be released, but we, we need to get a better understanding, a public uh, understanding of how this, uh, how this went so terribly awry. And, and, and until we do, I don't think we will have fully, uh, because this is going to be a long struggle, uh, our counterterrorism uh, efforts, and we need to start thinking that way. And if we take that seriously, then we need to understand, learn from our mistakes as the enemy learns from theirs and, and, uh, and get better at what we're doing. So I, I am hopeful that there will be some kind of uh, public accounting in order to, to move forward in a way that, uh, that benefits our uh, national security. I have one quick thing. Let me, let me throw out a, a suggestion to our, our congressional friends here. The, when the, some documents have been subpoenaed uh, in, in the U.S. Attorney in a firing investigation, I believe, uh, or, or – and test – and uh, – uh, 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 witnesses who refuse to appear were, have been cited, have been recommended to be cited for contempt. One of the things I think the Congress ought to consider uh, 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 as an alternative to going the contempt of Congress route uh, in the case of failure to produce witnesses or documents is a civil lawsuit. And uh, that's a, I mean, that's a subject for a whole other uh, right. discussion, we, we but ha we, uh, it, it, uh, We have tried to turn the, I want to thank the American Constitution Society for allowing us to take this very hot topic and turning it into a panel discussion about five or six very important topics, <laughs> any one of which would justify a full two, 90 minutes on its own, and thank the audience very much for uh, its patience and for these wonderful questions, and my fellow panelists for their insights and uh, engagement and their eagerness to engage with one another. Thanks very much.